So impacts. Uh, impacts of solids runoff, as many of you know, are surface water, uh, is, uh, phosphorus and nitrogen loading, which can lead to eutrophication. Um, with groundwater, conversion of organic nitrogen to nitrates can affect the aquifer. And uh, over-application of organics to a soil column can lead to uh, a reducing condition, which can lead to metal leaching. And these all can contaminate an aquifer. All right, so the benefits of my study. Um, the, basically, just a knowledge of the relationship of loading throughout an event. Uh, this could lead to a reduction of utilized manure storage that, are, that is incorporated with solid runoff. Um, this could also lead to more prescriptive loading. We can model to see what we can apply to filter strips and uh, what is being uh, treated so that the groundwater is un unaffected. And this is all for uh, standards for protection of watersheds. All right, just as a background for raw leachate, here, here are the common, common values as cited in literature. pH has a very low pH. Um, and then the nutrients are 10 times higher than raw residential uh, wastewater. Looks like my slide got a little messed up there. And then, uh, so most large dairy facilities use horizontal bunkers. Um, they're filled at immediately after a harvest and forges compacted seal, which creates, just creates the leachate. But then as the, the forage is being utilized and the bunker is being em emptied, there, there is, uh, the litter is exposed, and so is the silage, which has a high potential for silage runoff, has the highest potential out of any, any of the silage uh, storage facilities. So for the methods, we had three sites that we sampled over spring, summer, and fall, um, all within south central Wisconsin. For collection, we used uh, ISCO automated samplers. Uh, we, we took composite samples, so 14 bottles total, two samples per bottle. And these uh, samples were flow activated. Samples were then refrigerated within the sampler, sampler and analysis was completed at uh, University of Wisconsin. Uh, and al alkalinity, ammonia, BOD, COD, nitrite, nitrite, nitrate, solubo, reactive phosphorus, pH, total phosphorus, and total solids were quantified. So for the first site in south central Wisconsin was uh, ARS. This was a 530-head dairy, uh, 1.3 acres bunker. Uh, it had separate surface and subsurface collection, meaning uh, subsurface leachate was collected and uh, routed to a manure storage, and then the runoff was collected and um, was collected, but and and also routed to manure storage. But uh, the red lines there are showing the surface collection. The subsurface are lines showing uh, subsurface collection. And uh, only surface collection samples were collected at this site. Uh, my sampler's position where the star was. So here's another view showing uh, how, the, how the slope of the land was uh, facilitating the surface collection. And then here's the second site, a dairy forage. This is a little bit smaller, 350 head dairy, uh, about a half acre asphalt bunker. This, this uh, site had no subsurface collection and only surface sap samples were collected for analysis. So here's a view from uh, where the sampler is located, located. And then our third site was a pretty large dairy, 3,500 head dairy, almost two acres bunker pad. It had surface and subsurface collection, and surface and subsurface was sampled. So the three sites had uh, different different uh, bunker constructions and designs for surface and subsurface collection. So after the data was collected, methods for analysis, uh, the mean average storm uh, nutrient concentration was looked at for each storm at each site. And then also the flow data and the new loading data was normalized. Uh, this was a percentage of volume with percentage of cumulative load. This was so that the storms could be compared as uh, we collected a wide range of storm uh, 
storm or rain, rain events. And then with these curves, as, you, as shown in this illustration, a curve going straight up is more of a strong first flush. A curve at a 45 degree angle is uh, a uniform load, meaning loading did not change over the storm. And then uh, more of a curve going down would be uh, a strong delayed curve, meaning that there is more loading towards the end of the storm. So here's what the storm characteristics for Arlington. As you can see, we had a good range for uh, depth, about z almost close to zero to 1.5. And then uh, our highest max flow was 2.54 CFS. So different, different uh, storm events. And as a result, here's the normalized uh, curves for a couple of uh, storms that showed uh, some sort of different loading. In the top left corner is the depth. Um, that's how much ra rain. And then as you can see, a couple, a couple of storms were delayed for this site. And only one storm had that uh, first flush scenario. And as we looked at, at the maximum average storm nutrient, that, that occurred during early spring, spring. Minimum concentrations for COD and TP occurred in the summer. And then we had three storms illustrate an increase in concentrations with flow, so a moderate delayed storm, storm curve. And at this site, we only uh, were able to see a first flush that occurred in the fall. For our second site, again, we had a pretty wide uh, range of storms. We had 13 storms in total. And uh, we had a, a couple showing a little bit of more uh, uh, of extremes, a first flush, and more of a delayed. Um, again, as you can see, these uh, the different colors are uh, the different nutrients that were analyzed. And you can see some sort of correlation, except for a couple with the, most of the nutrients. And then we were able to, at this site to see uh, the strong uh, exponential decay with volume. So a really strong evidence for a first flush for three storms. Uh, this is BOD and COD. So as you can see, just really nice uh, looking exponential curve. And here's visually of what a first, our, our samples from a first flush looked like for that exponential decay. This was again in the fall. As you can see, the, the, the sample bottoms towards the left uh, are way more darker. These were uh, samples. Those four samples were probably taken within maybe the first thousand gallons. And then as the storm went on, you can see the, the samples are getting lighter in color, showing uh, more, less nutrient or less solids. So for results, um, the maximum average for uh, the storm nutrients uh, took place immediately after filling the bunker in the fall thinking because there's a large amount of feed on the pad. The minimum, again, took, it, took place during the summer with a large storm with high uh, full, full, uh, max flow volumes. And then in the fall, uh, we had that extreme uh, strong decay curve. In the spring, we had a weak first flush. In the summers, we had uh, more of a delayed loading with the high peak flows. So for the third site, we had 11 storms sampled. Again, we had different storms showing different loading depending on the time of year, as you can see with uh, these graphs here with the different storm sizes. These are all the same rain depth, and they, they're showing different uh, uh, load distributions. And then for this site, uh, because of the sampler position in a culvert, uh, lag time and samples may have missed peak concentrations, so we might not have been able to see a first flush. But uh, the max for the flow weight and nutrients are, took place uh, close to filling. Minimum were in the spring for the minimum weighted flow concentrations. And uh, some summer offs uh, displayed a moderate delayed storm curve. And we had uh, one show a moderate first flush. So conclusions, what do we do with all this data? Um, strongest 
first flash evidence took place in the fall. This is with filling. Uh, there's more leachate on the pad, and um, highest average storm nutrient concentrates were in the fall, in the following filling, and, and sometimes in the spring. And then the lowest average storm nutrient concentrations were in the summer. And uh, again, the summer showed more delayed. This could have been because uh, there was less, there was more uh, litter on the pad following uh, the bunkers em emptying. And then high end concentrations among all sites were for dairy forage initial samples where we could actually see uh, those uh, first thousand. We could actually collect those pretty well at dairy forage. So some people I'd like to acknowledge, I'd like to acknowledge the, the funding, Wisconsin Groundwater Recording Council, my advisor, and some people that helped me in the lab and my committee. Now I'd like to open up for questions. Right. Um, that was kind of incorporated within the dairy forage. Those, those strong concentrated samples were the leachate, but we weren't uh, trying to sample just the leachate alone. We we're looking more towards the runoff. But yeah, as you can see, like that's typically what leachate will, will be that dark, like coffee color. So uh, that and that had values closer to uh, recorded literature leachate values. Okay, first question uh, was with subsurface and whether I was collecting it. Only one site had subsurface sampled. Uh, the surface and subsurface were sampled together, so we weren't specifically looking at just the subsurface. We were, sp we were only looking at a surface and subsurface, more towards looking at the runoff. But and and the t these bunker piles were covered majority of the time. They were they're only uncovered when they're uh, unloading them to feed the cattle. <laughs> 